What I want to try to cover in my lecture to today and also tomorrow is, uh, I guess, a, a view of these uh, deep, uh, deep network or deep learning models from the point of view of natural scene statistics and, and neurobiology. So I guess another way of thinking about this is what can these uh, deep networks tell us about the brain? And uh, so uh, I should also mention that a lot of the material that um, I'm going to be talking about both today and tomorrow, I've just uh, um, finished completing a review article on with uh, Mike Lewicki. And it's going to appear in this uh, new volume on the new visual neurosciences. And uh, I will try to get a PDF of that um, available later today. Um, so um, if you're interested in learning more about some of this stuff. So uh, what I want to try to uh, cover today is this, this question of, well, why, why natural scene statistics? Why is it uh, of interest um, to us in neuroscience? And why, uh, why should it also be of interest to us in, uh, in computer vision and uh, other areas of machine learning? And so I'll go into a little bit about biology here um, and then talk about this, the uh, sort of building up to these um, hierarchical models, talk, talking about the theory of redundancy reduction, which is kind of the way people started out using natural scene statistics um, in, uh, in, in studies of the visual system. And then going on to these, uh, these models of sparse coding and group sparse coding. And, uh, and then tomorrow I'll uh, um, take this into the realm of hierarchical models, models composed of multiple layers that try to exploit these, um, uh, try to make mo models of natural images and uh, in a sense to try to get at what um, these multiple, multiple layers of representation are doing. Um, in the brain. So the, the question that really uh, that motivates um, a lot of this study to us is to try to understand what are the information processing principles going on in this system. And uh, so there's a lot that's been learned um, in um, neuroscience and psychophysics. Um, psychophysics studies the system from the outside without putting needles and electrodes into the brain just by studying its behavior and trying to ascertain what might be going on inside based on uh, what observers report. And neuroscience um, puts uh, electrodes inside and tries to make direct measurements inside the system. And this is sort of a cartoonish, uh, cartoonish uh, diagram of that um, sort of approach made by David Hubel, David Hubel uh, where you're putting an electrode here into the uh, visual cortex. Uh, the, you wouldn't do this in a human brain, uh, but, uh, but uh, you put an electrode into the uh, visual cortex and you record what the neurons are doing here in response to some uh, stimulus that's put um, on, on the display here. And so we've, lo we've learned loads about the system through a combination of these neurophysiological studies and neuroanatomical studies um, over the past several decades. Uh, but what I'm going to argue here is that uh, what we've really learned so far is limited uh, in, um, in the sense that it's very hard to relate these findings to what we know about natural scenes. So, um, so a lot of these approaches have been um, done, as I mentioned, by taking some test stimulus or probe stimulus and putting it on this display here, and then looking at how the neurons respond to the stimulus in isolation. And, and the problem is that it's very difficult to translate what this stimulus means in the context of natural scenes. So when we, when we look at a natural image, in fact, it's very difficult to sort of ask, well, what are the features in this image? Right? What, if you just sort of, when you look at a scene, what are the features of the world? And to a large degree, people have been sort of ans answering this question introspectively. And they look out at the world, they say, well, I see you know, objects, and these objects have boundaries and contours. And so these contours, uh, these edges, are the features that I'll study. And so I'll sort of present these edges and so forth in isolation. But as we know, uh, as machine um, uh, or computer vision learned um, long ago, uh, what constitutes an edge in a natural image is a highly ill-posed problem. And this is just a demonstration of that. So when we look at this um, scene here, a very simple scene of a log uh, against a background of rocks, um, it appears very apparent that you know, where, the, where the boundary of the log is, any three-year-old could trace the outline of this, uh, of this object. But when we zoom in on the data that's actually available there, that your neurons are working from, uh, this is what we would see. So if we just zoomed in a section of that contour um, of the log, uh, this is just the pixel data. And over to the right here, I'm trying to show the, um, a simulation of a model bank of V1 neurons that are oriented, sort of selected to different orientations at different positions within this, within this scene. And this gray line indicates the position of, this, um, of this, uh, the boundary of this log within the image. 
And at each point, uh, what I'm depicting here, the length of a line at a particular point indicates the uh, response of a neuron at that position and selected that orientation. So the longer the line, the more the response of that neuron. Okay, so, uh, so you know, I think one of the things you sort of learn from this exercise when you take a natural scene and just uh, process it with an array of oriented filters, you find that very rarely do these filters respond where you think they should respond. And oftentimes, um, they respond in places where you don't think they should respond at all. And, uh, and so this is, I think, that something that, um, as, I, as I mentioned, that computer vision learned early on, that this problem of finding the edges in a scene is a, is a highly ill-posed problem. And in fact, it's still with us today in, in many, many respects. And so answering this question depends heavily upon context and high-level knowledge in order to extract what constitutes an edge, um, an edge in a scene. Or another way of saying that is that we need a good model of the world in order to answer this question. It's not something you can, you can derive in a purely bottom-up fashion. And so that's, uh, that's sort of led to this view that, um, that we need to think of vision as an inference problem. Okay, so that's what's going on in vision is that we're, we're getting all these measurements about the world in the form of image pixels. And these image pixels are really just projections of a 3D world onto the 2D image plane. And, uh, and so what you're trying to do in the nervous system is recover something about the properties of the world, what's going on in the environment out there. And the problem is, this is a, this is a highly ill-posed problem because um, there, any given pixel measurement here in the retina uh, contains a mixture of many factors of things going on in the environment. So there's the, the, the illuminant, uh, information about its brightness, its wavelength um, distribution. Uh, surfaces, the orientation of the surface with respect to the light determines how much light it's going to reflect. Uh, the reflectance properties of the surface, how much light it absorbs in different wavelengths and so forth. Uh, atmospheric properties between the observer and, and the object and so forth. And so all these different factors conspire together into a single pixel value here, right? And so your problem is, as an observer is to kind of work backwards and figure out, well, from all these many pixel values, what's going on in the world? And of course, this is, since it's a highly opposed problem, you can't answer that without having a model. Um, a model of, the, uh, of how the data were generated somehow, the model that somehow constrains your interpretation. So the idea here in this sort of approach of natural scene statistics is to, you know, just step back and rather than sort of think about the problem introspectively, um, because our introspections can often be a very poor guide as to where the problems are, to think about the problem from a mathematical perspective and say, okay, well, what, you know, what are the structure of images out there and how can we build good mathematical models um, of this data, and if we have good models, if we can build uh, models of this data, then maybe that will inform us about the kinds of models that are going on in the cortex. So the hypothesis is that inside of the cor cortex, there's somehow a model um, of, how, of how this data were generated. And so if we want to learn something about what these neurons are doing, if we believe a model is there, then it's going to behoove us to, to build models of, of natural images, so that we're going to be that much better informed when we look up what the neurons are doing. Okay, so um, of course, as you might imagine, this is, um, this is in itself um, um, not, not, a, not an easy thing to do. So, so the problem is that uh, biology, uh, the way the nervous system works at least, is um, it's composed of many tiny, um, tiny elements that are all sort of packed in there together. So to give you kind of a, um, um, an appreciation of that, we'll just sort of, sort of delve into the scales of things here. So this is just a depiction of the um, visual areas in the macaque monkey brain the colored areas are those um, involved in visual processing. And there's about 30 or so different um, areas that have been involved, uh, that have been identified in the, in the macaque monkey. Uh, and so that we're in the macaque monkey, so this is reversed from the human brain. I just showed you the eye would be out here to the right. Okay, and then the visual cortex areas are in here in the back. And V1 is the primary visual cortex areas that receives its information from the LGN. It in turn sends a major projection to V2, uh, which in turn projects to V4 and so forth. And then there's these, this whole, um, sort of complex of different visual areas. And uh, there's a wire, a very, very famous wiring diagram of these um, areas that was made by um, David Van Essen and, um, and uh, uh, Dan Fellman, um, um, uh, and Fellman about 20 years ago. And, uh, and so that, um, so that, that's, one, that's, that's one way of depicting it. But I want to show you here is a, um, as a sort of a, a redrawing of that diagram made by Jeff Hawkins which is um, quite informative because here what, what, uh, what Jeff has done is to take each of these visual areas and rescale it according to the amount of um, area, surface area that it occupies in the cortex. So just going back a slide, um, you could take, so all these uh, different visual areas, um, that, well, I'm sorry, the, the cerebral cortex as a whole is a two-dimensional uh, sheet, 
and you can essentially flatten out that um, two-dimensional two sheet. And, and then you can judge you know, how big these areas are in terms of the amount of surface area that, that they consume on that two-dimensional sheet. And so here, each of those areas is drawn. The length of each of those bars indicates the amount of surface area consumed by one of those visual areas. And uh, so what you can see here, what's, what's really interesting, I think, is, um, is that these, these uh, lower visual areas, so area V1 and area V2, consume a humongous amount of the surface area in the visual cortex. And so we might have think of those as areas that are involved in sort of low level or intermediate level aspects of vision. If you put your electrode into these uh, neurons in these areas, um, you'll find that the receptive fields, the part of visual space that respond to is highly localized. They respond to um, features in the, within those localized regions, but they do not respond to entire objects. Um, you, you cannot activate neurons in there. They don't seem to be selective to you know, the entire sort of global properties of the object. They're doing some kind of local analysis of the image. And it's not until you get to these higher areas up here in the infratemporal cortex that you find neurons that seem to care about uh, the global properties of an image or of a scene. And uh, so somehow, magically, there's this transformation that goes on between these lower level areas and these higher level areas. And, uh, and the thing that's very suggestive about this is, is you know, what biology is telling us is that it, it likes to spend, it wants to spend uh, a huge amount of hardware to reformatting the information in some sense. Uh, before it can do these things, uh, these sort of high-level aspects of vision. And, uh, and this also sort of makes another illustration that these, there's these sort of uh, parcellation of two different streams. Other speakers may have alluded to it as well. So uh, these, these areas in um, yellow, I guess, are the in, uh, areas involved in the so-called ventral uh, processing stream involved in uh, objects or shape analysis, where these uh, boxes in blue are the ones in the, uh, in the dorsal stream, which are more, seem to be more involved in um, processing information about relative spatial relationships among objects. And they don't seem to be so selective to um, object shape. So um, another thing I should uh, comment about this uh, chart is, uh, is that, uh, is that it, sort of, it sort of makes, it sort of you know, gives the view of like, uh, you know, everything is progressing towards this goal of you know, getting representation of objects up here. And that these intermediate level areas are just kind of a slave to that. And they're maybe not of much use in them you know, to read out, per se. But one thing we know about the neuroanatomy is that all of these different visual areas, it turns out, have motor outputs. Okay? So it's not as though it's not in the system. What the anatomy tells us is not like you know, you're just sort of processing all this information to get this high level output, like the recognition, the label of the object. And then that goes, you know, that's the output of the visual system. And then that goes to drive actions or something like that. There's, there's, there's afferents coming out of all these different visual areas, huge, huge fiber bundles that are coming out of all these different visual areas that drive various aspects of the motor system. For example, V1, these neurons from V1 are involved in driving eye movements. Okay, so, so it's, not like, it, it's not like you're sort of you know, processing things to some, un, to some end stage up here. Okay, so, um, so that looks, um, so, so one thing, you know, I think when, when, we, when we look at, when you see this, this sort of stacked hierarchy of areas, it looks like a deep network. Uh, and so it kind of, uh, you know, it suggests there, might, there should be some connection here to, to what we're talking about in these deep network models and maybe what some principles of what's going on in the brain. So just now to take us um, sort of a step, a step um, deeper <laughs> in, in detail, uh, so what we're going to do here is zoom in on uh, one of these visual areas, V1. So if we look at um, uh, just this is the, the surface of the macaque monkey brain fr from the back, um, taking out a cross section. If we take a cross section out of uh, the cerebral cortex here, this is what we would see in a nissel stain. And so this is what I was alluding to earlier, that the, uh, the cerebral cortex is essentially, essentially a two-dimensional sheet of neurons. This sheet is basically high, highly folded in on itself. So this is all one contiguous um, two-dimensional sheet, and you're just looking at it one, one cross-section of that sheet here. Okay, so it's highly infolded on itself. And, and the sheet itself is about two millimeters thick, and so we can zoom in on one of these, uh, one of these sections of the, of the sheet here, and that's what we would see in a nissel stain. And so each of these dots here, you can, they're not very well resolved in this picture, but each of these dots here corresponds to an individual neuron. And, uh, and there's about six, uh, six layers that have been identified and sublayers to these la other layers um, that have been identified. Okay, so, uh, so one sort of unit of a, a cortex, in, at least in the, in the primary visual cortex, that's been identified is what's um, known as a hypercolumn. A hypercolumn is basically a representation, a full representation of visual space over both left and right eyes. So the information from the left and right eyes comes, together, comes in from the thalamus um, segregated. 
and then mixes in these more superficial layers. But uh, if, if you have about a square millimeter, um, the unit of about a square millimeter of cortex contains a full representation from both left and right eyes in all different orientations. And uh, so in a square millimeter, there are about um, 100,000 uh, neurons. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, these 100,000 neurons within a square millimeter are getting input only from about a 14 by 14 pixel um, image array. That's independent of where you are in the cortex or in the retina. So as you may know, the, the retina is not sampled uh, uniformly. It's sampled most densely in the fovea, and then the sampling density falls off with eccentricity. But no matter where you are um, in, the, in, the, in, in the system, there, you could think of there as being um, about a 14 by 14 uh, resolution um, or pixel image that's basically coming into a square millimeter of cortex. Okay? And so there's 100,000 neurons processing all that information. And that's kind of a hard number to get, get your head around, at least. So um, to me, it's kind of helpful to imagine what that, what that means. What that corresponds to is about the same number of people um, in a stadium, right? If you fill up a stadium with people, there's about 100,000, at least in the Rose Bowl here, um, there's about 100,000 uh, people that fit into a stadium. So you might imagine like this many, this many neurons um, processing um, the information only from a 14 by 14 uh, pixel image patch. Um, so to me, at least, that's very staggering. I mean, I have no idea. My, none of my models sort of fit with that. And I don't know anybody's that do that would sort of suggest why you need this many neurons to process such a, um, a small region of the image. Okay, so we can zoom in further here. Uh, take any one of these people in the crowd as a neuron, right? And typically, the, not, that's sort of another way you want to think about it is when you, when you put electrode into the cortex and you record from a neuron, a single neuron, you're listening to one of these people, right? And what they're saying about the image, right? And so if we zoom in on uh, one, of those, one of those people in the crowd, that's a neuron. And a neuron itself is, uh, is a highly complex information processing device. So the models that we typically make of them are kind of uh, actually an insult to the biology. Uh, so the model that sort of we all talk about is this idea that um, any given neuron summates all of its inputs. So you have all these inputs that are pinging upon it, on the dendrites. For an average cortical neuron, that may be between, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 inputs from other neurons. And we sum all those inputs together. And then the soma, the cell body, makes uh, a, a threshold. It thresholds that, that signal and, and decides whether to send out a spike or not uh, based on that. But what we know from the biophysics is that there's a lot of nonlinear signal integration occurring on these dendritic trees. So um, we, we, we can almost guarantee that these signals do not combine linearly on the dendritic trees. And so you can think of a single neuron as essentially as something like a multilayer neural network where um, inputs may combine linearly or pseudo-linearly within a thin branch. Um, and then that, that maybe the output of that, you can think of the output of that thin branch being thresholded and all these thresholded sums being accumulated into the soma. So this is the work of uh, Bartlett Mill um, here at USC has done quite a bit of um, uh, trying to model these dendritic nonlinearities and their computational implications. And uh, so, that's, uh, so that's a single neuron. And now we can zoom in further to, um, to one of those um, regions of synapses there on, the, on, on a dendritic um, segment. And this is what you would see if you took a, um, a cross-section of brain tissue, right? So all those wonderful kind of cartoon visualizations you see of the brain, where there's like a neuron, and then like it's, you know, at, its processes are stretching out, there's another neuron, its processes are going over there, and there's all this space in between them, right? There's no space in the brain uh, between these neurons. Everything's kind of jammed together, right? Every, all, all the wires are kind of, you know, bunched up against each other, against, against the, the neurons. And so if you take a cross-section of brain tissue, that's what you would see. It's basically just a cross-section of a bunch of axons and dendrites and astrocytes and blood vessels and so forth, all the supporting tissue that's there. Okay? And uh, so, so when we look at an uh, uh, EM micrograph, that's the scale at which we're able to resolve um, synaptic structures. So, for example, um, you know, so where two, where two cell membranes are meeting here, you see a bunch of vesicles. These are little sort of like bubbles of, of neurotransmitter that are, uh, that are um, bunched up on one side. Um, that's basically a, a synaptic connection where one, signal, one, one neuron is sending a signal to another. OK, so we can zoom in on one of those um, synapses further. And we see that uh, within a synapse, there's a whole you know, computational cascade that goes on there. The synapse is not a sort of like a single scalar structure. There's a whole bunch of different um, um, channels and receptors that live on these membranes that determine how signals get 
um, propagated across, um, from, one, from one neuron to the next, and also how these synapses change over time, their plasticity effects. Okay, so it's a so there's a there's a lot of diversity in there. That's that's that, um, and a lot of this diversity has been revealed only recently, like within the past couple of years, through um, through a variety of different methods. Okay, so so this isn't meant to um, scare you or depress you. Um, it's meant to excite you um, that uh, you know biology is is incredibly complex, and there's a huge amount of complexity there in the information processing, right, in the signal trans um, in the signal transduction that can possibly occur. And so I think what we want to be thinking about in our models is, you know, not what we can do with multilayer perceptrons, but, you know, how can we exploit these nonlinearities that, that biology gives us to do the to, to powerful, powerful forms of computation, and how are those um, involved in, in perception. And uh, so, so one place I think I would appeal to where, um, where we see principles at work in biology, right? It's not just a mess. It may seem like a mess when we look at all that sort of that 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 um, that detail and complexity in the in the in the, in the um, at, at a very fine level. But one place where we see these principles at work is in the design of eyes. Okay, so that's very clear. And this is uh, this is uh, just a, an illustration from a very nice article on the evolution of eyes by uh, Michael Land and Russell Fernald, where what they're depicting here is sort of one story. For um, for how you know these various eye designs have evolved, starting with a very simple eye over here, a pit eye, which is simply uh, a set of photoreceptors that are put into uh, sort of a cup in the skin. It doesn't have a lens or anything like that. It's a very simple form of eye. And uh, and then an another sort of innovation was to try to make a better image by uh, by making a small aperture, a pinhole um, pinhole camera. So there's some animals. That, that use this kind of system, but of course this animal can only survive in very bright um, conditions. And so one major innovation was, innovation was to um, invent some refracting material and put it in here to bend the light uh, so that you could gather um, the information over this entire aperture, uh, all the light over this entire aperture, and focus it in just on one part, um, one part uh, of, of the retina. And so there's um, different, various ways of doing that. One way is to put a lens here. Other animals use, um, use uh, parabolic mirrors um, in the back of, of their eyes. This is not the same as a reflecting tapetum. You know, when you put a flashlight in the cat's eye and, this, and the eyes shine back, that reflection is in part just for um, amplification of the light. These, these are mirrors that actually do refraction. They, they play the same role of a lens okay, for doing the focusing. And uh, these are the, this, this is illustrating the spherical lenses of the fish. And these spherical lenses, what's interesting about them is that to make an optimal design of a spherical lens, you have to change the index or refraction of the material as you go from the inside of the lens to the outside. So it's not one constant index or refraction of the material. And you have to change that in a certain way to make the lens optimal. And in fact, if you look at these spherical lenses in fish, they are in fact optimal in the way they, they change their index of refraction. And these different um, spherical lens designs have evolved independently at least seven or eight times. Okay, so over and over again, sort of nature has discovered the same solution for how to design um, a lens in this case. And then, of course, we have our um, eye down here, which is just one of many types. So I think what, what's what's interesting to me about this this um, this story is that uh, is that if you want to build an eye, um, there's only so many ways you can do it. And one thing that biology and evolution had to work around are the principles of optics. Okay, so that's one thing that just sort of exists out there. And once you know about the principles of optics, then you can look at all these des eye designs and make sense of them. Okay, it's very sensible. If you didn't know about optics, you'd be completely hosed. You'd be looking at all these different eye designs. You'd be saying, wow, you know, biology is really complicated. Um, you know, so what are we going to do? Uh, but, uh, but when you know about optics, it makes perfect sense. And so those principles are at work there. And by the way, I would um, steer you, for those of, it, those of you interested, and learning more about this, a very, a really excellent book by um, Michael Land and uh, Dan Nielsen on animal eyes. We just did a seminar on it at Berkeley uh, last spring term, and you can also look at this wiki page for other, other readings in this area. It got me very excited about this um, subject area. So, so I, I guess one of the things I want to sort of then persuade you of is that in the same way that, that optics governs the design of eyes, there are similar information processing principles that govern the design of nervous systems. So the same way that all these cells had to sort of form and shape themselves in a way to, to channel the light in a certain way, to, to, to collect photons, and to channel those photons in certain ways, in fact optimally, right, to create an image, okay, 
that there's are, there are similar, similar principles at work uh, in nervous systems in the, way that, in the way that neurons are processing information, right? That there's some principles that govern how these neurons are sort of channeling information and sending it to various other neurons, the kinds of transformations they're computing on information. The difference is that whereas optics is something we can read about, right? It was written down more than 200 years ago. We can just open up a book and read about it and translate into that and see the connection to biology. Most of these information processing principles haven't been written about yet. A few have. Maybe deep networks is one of them. But, but the vast majority of them have yet to be described and written down. And so we're in this odd you know, position in neuroscience where we're trying to, at, at the same time, discover uh, these principles, what they are, and, and then also understand their connection to, to the biology and what we're looking at in, in all the neurons. OK, so what, one, of the, one of the ideas I'm going to try to convince you of today is that one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the principles at work is this idea of efficient coding. And uh, so the, the principle is stated there. Um, and it's a very simple idea that, that what the system is trying to do, and this is not just in the visual system, but really in any sensory system, is that it's trying to, it's trying to code the information in such a way that, that it can represent the most amount of information with the fewest possible uh, physical resources, fewest number of neurons, and the least amount of energy um, to do so. So this idea was first um, described and uh, proposed uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a long time ago by um, a, a psychologist, Fred, Fred Atniav, and a neuroscientist, uh, Horace Barlow. And uh, what's interesting about you know, this, this work is this was, this was very, um, very soon after the advent of information theory in the, in the late 1940s that these people in psychology and neuroscience were very qu quick to grasp upon this idea and try to see its connection to neuroscience and, and how information was being uh, processed and, and, and conveyed in the brain. So, so Horace Barlow, the way he sort of put this um, in, his, in his paper in 1961, is the idea that what neurons should be trying to do, at least at early stages of processing, is try to recode information in such a way that reduces the amount of statistical dependencies that are there in the data. So the idea is that you start out with the raw data representation, just with the photoreceptor array, that there's all these, there's all these statistical dependencies among the photoreceptors. Those statistical dependencies are there not because of some intrinsic property of light or photoreceptors themselves or the eye. Those dependencies are there for the most part because of the world, right? It's the fact that the world is structured. And the fact that the world is structured is giving rise to these statistical dependencies um, in, in the retina. And so what Horace Barlow argued is that what the nervous system try to, should try to do is transform the information, reformat it in such a way that these statistical dependencies are reduced. Okay, so that was simply this idea of redundancy reduction, reducing the, reducing the redundancy um, in the system. And so another way of saying that is that you're trying to maximize channel capacity. And uh, you can see that this would make a lot of sense in something like the optic nerve, where you have a bottleneck in the system, right? Where you have um, a huge number of photoreceptors, so there's about 100 million or so photoreceptors in the eye, and only about a million fibers coming out of the eye. So we have this bottleneck problem of trying to sort of jam a lot of information into a small number of wires, and, 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 and trying to do that most efficiently. And so, this, uh, so, so although Barlow uh, proposed this idea uh, at this point, I guess more than uh, 50, 50 years ago, um, it, uh, it, took a, it took quite a while before people kind of grasped onto it and tried to make a quantitative theoretical model out of it. So if you read Barlow's original paper, it's mostly a verbal model. There's a, sort of a, some information theory equations in there, but that's about it. Um, he didn't really sort of flesh it out in terms of a detailed model of information processing. So it wasn't until much later that um, Simon Laughlin showed that uh, this idea is work at work in the way in the, that you could explain the, um, the contrast response functions of neurons in the fly visual system in terms of, contra in terms of um, histogram equalization, which is sort of the first order form of redundancy reduction, that you want to make use of all your different voltage, voltage levels as a neuron and conveying the fluctuations of light levels. And then later, by, um, by Laughlin, Srinivasan, and Dubbs, proposing a model for um, how, how the, um, what the lateral inhibition may be doing in the retina. So their view of the, what the lateral inhibition then was doing is basically trying to decorrelate images. And so they were able to, uh, by measuring the, the correlations that are actually present in the environment, uh, they were able to make a prediction for what would be um, sort of the optimal decorrelating filter. And they showed that the, uh, the receptive fields one finds in the retina are, make a very close to, match to that. So, and then, uh, so later, uh, David Field uh, po pointed out 
another way of characterizing these correlations that are present in images in terms of the power spectrum. So, uh, so what he what he showed here, this is sort of the power. The, the Fourier domain makes a sort of convenient way of characterizing these pairwise correlations because the the Fourier transform of the auto autocorrelation function, assuming the statistics are stationary, right? You just wanted sort of the the, the correlations of, as a function of relative spatial separation. Then uh, the Fourier transform of the of the power of the autocorrelation function is the power spectrum. So what he uh, what David Field did is just to take a rotational average of the power spectrum and look at how power falls off as a, free, as a function of frequency for a number of different images. And he saw this very um, sort, of, uh, sort of lawful relationship observed uh, among a variety of images. In fact, it's very hard. You sort of convince yourself it's very hard to find an image that deviates strongly from this trend. Okay, And this was something that actually was known about for quite a while in the television industry. Uh, they just they sort of observed it, and they knew about it. They talked about it, but nobody sort of wrote it down and described it in a paper. And so, um, so David, uh, that was one of the you know, sort of first observations that Lee's documented about. But David went a step further to say, well, if, if the power spectrum is of this form, then what are its implications for coding in the visual system? Um, what would we expect um, neurons to do about that? So David had uh, one answer in terms of um, basically wavelets, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but uh, another, another uh, sort of um, way of, of thinking about that uh, was proposed by um, Attic and Rudlich. Joe Attic was, who was a, uh, started out as a string theorist and then came into neuroscience. And, uh, and so what, what Joe Attic proposed is basically that, well, in terms of the Fourier domain, if what you want to get out is a decorrelated image, then what, what that corresponds to in the Fourier domain is just having a white or flat power spectrum as a function of frequency. So what he argued then is that if, if the image is coming in, it falls as 1 over the frequency in amplitude, then you want to multiply by um, another function in the Fourier domain, the transfer function, the filter that you want to multiply by is something that essentially just rises linearly with frequency. Okay, and that would be what would decorrelate you. So that would be sort of like an idealized um, whitening filter. And uh, so if you take the inverse Fourier transform of this function, it corresponds pretty well to the spatial receptive fields uh, one sees in, um, in, in the retina. But it has yet to be actually explicitly tested. So no one's actually uh, you know, looked at a population of um, retinal ganglion cells and showed that their correlations are actually reduced in response to natural scenes. But this idea has been tested in the, um, in the time domain by, uh, by Yang Dan. And uh, what, they, what they did here is by showing a movie, which it turns out has um, also a 1 over f spectrum in time. This, the full space-time power spectrum is non-separable, but at least uh, it's 1 over f in time for the DC component. And so they, uh, so they showed a movie here. In this case, it happened to be the movie Casablanca to a cat, to a sleeping cat. In fact, to anesthetized cat, and uh, but you know the the theory is that its retina and LGN are still working, and so they recorded from neurons in the LGN, and showed that the uh, the correlations coming out of the LGN are um, are vastly reduced. So even though the correlations coming in in this movie are very strong over time, they're going to be very strong temporal correlations. If you just look at any one point in the image um, over time, when you look in the LGN at a point in the LGN over time. Um, its autocorrelation function is pretty much like a delta function. So these are three, what we're showing here, what um, they're showing here are three different neurons and their autocorrelation function over time. So there's pretty, pretty much a sharp spike. And down here is the power spectrum of the signal coming out of the LGN. Okay, if you just look at the instantaneous firing rate of that neuron over time and compute its Fourier transform, it's, um, it's very flat. Okay, and that's again a, a, a very, in vast contrast to, to what's coming in, which is highly um, correlated and, and falls off as 1 over f kind of over time. OK, so interestingly, though, what they showed is that these, these LGN neurons, they don't just whiten anything. Um, they, they whiten specifically natural scenes. So if you put white noise into the system, then you would not expect the white noise to come out decorrelated. And in fact, it does not. So it comes out colored. So, so now this, this, what we're showing here for these three neurons is the autocorrelation function in response to um, white noise. And this is the power spectrum in, the, in response to white noise, which reveals this sort of whitening um, function of the filter, its transfer function. OK, so that was kind of a very encouraging, I think, to a lot of people at the time, because you had this nice correspondence between a theory, a theoretical prediction of what the system should be doing in terms of, a, in terms of an efficient coding principle, and um, some actual data about how neurons really code, um, code information in space and time. So, uh, so one thing that uh, Attic talked a little bit about, but didn't really sort of put fully into his theory, is 
um, how to deal with neural noise. So neurons don't have infinite precision in terms of how they code information. So they have limited coding precision. And so, uh, so uh, Isabro Doi and Mike Lewicki sort of put this into the equation, what they called framework they called robust coding. So the idea here then is to think about the, what are the filters you should build not only to remove correlations, because um, you, 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 can, you don't want to reduce all the redundancy. You want to leave some redundancy there, because you need to protect against noise. And so uh, if, you, if you introduce channel noise, then that sort of changes um, the outlook on what kind of a filter you build. So what they're able to show here, then, is the optimal filter depends basically on the signal-to-noise level you have in these neurons. So a very, very, very noisy neuron, you're going to expect that its receptive fields would be sort of more sort of Gaussian-like or blob-like low-pass filter. And for uh, a, a almost noiseless neuron, then it, and it's more like a bandpass filter. It has this sort of full whitening characteristic. And uh, I think the most recent version on this work is, uh, in my view, I think really, really, really nice piece of work uh, by Don Carklin and Ira Simoncelli, where they looked at, uh, where, they, where they now sort of considered a whole population of neurons and how you could learn these receptive fields with, uh, with a nonlinear, with a pointwise nonlinearity um, in, in the system as well. So what, what, they're, what, they, what their sort of single processing cascade is shown here, you start with the image. Um, that image has some additive noise. And then you have a population of neurons that are processing that information. Each neuron has its own weight vector, a receptive field, processing the image. And then the result of that weighted sum goes through a pointwise nonlinearity, point non a monotonically increasing function, which you're also going to learn. Uh, and then the result is that you're going to get some array of outputs here that also have noise added to them. And so the objective function is simply that you want to maximize the mutual formation between these outputs here and the image subject to a constraint in the firing rate. So you want to minimize the overall mean firing rate of this whole population of neurons. And almost miraculously, what pops out of there is the whole population of on-center cells and off-center cells. This is the one thing we know about the retina. The very first stage of processing, basically in the retina, takes the outputs of the photoreceptors and splits it into two channels, one coding positive differences and one coding negative differences about the mean. Okay? So these two populations of neurons, on and off cells, that come out of the retina. So you get these two populations of emer emerging of on-center and off-cells. And interestingly, if you look at these, uh, you can see that they're not really symmetric. The, the, um, the, the off-cells tend to be smaller and more, more numerous, uh, both in the model and also um, in, 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 the, in the data. So if you look at the populations of neurons in the retina, they have smaller receptive fields and they tire tile, receptive uh, tile space more, um, more finely. OK. So, so that's sort of the idea with the, with the efficient coding. So it's a really nice principle that we can state uh, very, very concisely. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence sort of indicating that something like that is going on in early stages of the visual system, like in the retina and in the, in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And uh, oh boy, I just realized. OK, so I, should, I, I meant to ask, as I mentioned in the beginning, please ask questions. Uh, as I go along. <laughs> so I encourage questions. You've been kind of silent. And so if I'm saying words like lateral geniculate nucleus, which you've never heard before, and what is that? Somebody should raise their hand and say, what are you talking about? Somebody going to ask, yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. so, sorry for skipping over that, but I should have mentioned that earlier. So, um, and, uh, and the lateral geniculate nucleus, just to make it real brief here, so that back to the first slide here. Um, the, uh, it basically, that's just the, the so it's that kind of, you could think of it as like a relay nucleus. The lateral geniculate nucleus is a, it's a nucleus of the thalamus that relays information from the, LG, from the retina to the visual cortex back here. So all the sensory information, from not just from vision, but all the senses goes through the thalamus, except for olfaction. But all senses go through the thalamus and then they go to the cortex. Okay, so the, so the, when, uh, by recording from um, the LGN, that's sort of another take on what these signals in the, in the retina are doing. Roughly speaking. Okay. Okay. So, so then, how to think about you know these next stages of processing when we when we go to the cortex? So the the idea, as I, as I mentioned, with with this idea of redundancy reduction, it makes sense when you have a bottleneck, when you have a lot of information that you want to jam through a very small number of neurons. Uh, but uh, when we get to the cortex, the exact opposite is the case. Okay. So if anything, V one. Area V1, the primary visual cortex, where the information first comes in the cortex, it actually expands the dimension, dimensionality of the representation. So here's what you would see if you looked at a cross section of, of V1. Each circle here denotes the outline of an individual neuron. 
an initial stain, like that picture I showed you before. Now they've outlined, Horace Barlow has you know, painstakingly outlined all the, all the different neurons that are sitting in there. And each red dot corresponds to an LGN fiber come in. Okay, so a fiber from the LGN, you can essentially think of as a pixel coming from a retina, a whitened pixel, if you will, okay? A decorrelated pixel coming from the retina, okay? So that's, that's the spacing of information. That's the sort of density of the image information you have coming in, okay? And then you, the same picture just kind of coming out of the board as well. These fibers be kind of spaced equivalently coming out of the board. So some array of LGN fibers coming in. And this is the number of neurons that you have receiving and processing that information just in the la layer four, in the recipient layer of uh, V1. So as one can see here, this is not a bottleneck. If any, it's an inverse bottleneck, right? You're taking now a small number of fibers and you're expanding the dimensionality of the representation onto a huge number of neurons. In fact, the overcompleteness ratio is approximately 100 to 1. Okay, there's so 100 neurons here for every fiber here. That's not to say that one fiber projects only to 100 neurons here individually. They, they overlap in the, proje in the projection. And any, any given neuron here is receiving input from multiple of these LGN fibers coming in. Okay? Bruno, so there's about a million LGN turns <coughs> on the front. Um, so is it fair then to say you made this analogy to pixels? So it, it, the, the images that we should process, should they be 1,000 by 1,000? Ah, okay, uh, yeah, roughly, yeah, a million total fibers. I mean, we're just talking, these are very rough numbers. Uh, actually, in human, it's more like 1.5 million. But, uh, yeah, you could square that and think of the, the equivalent resolution coming in from the retina is something like 1,000 by 1,000 so um, image. So that's what Google needs to scale to. Yeah, well, scale down to, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's a, one, it's, a, it's, a, it's a one megapixel image. So, uh, I mean, a one megapixel image is not, uh, that's nothing, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. That's the key, right? So this is not, it's not a uniform one, but, but still, I mean, it's remarkable to think that the, you know, what's coming in at any given instant is the, is the equivalent to only about a one megapixel um, image. But it, of course, right, that's very densely taking those, what, those one million pixels, you're putting the vast majority of them around the central one or two degrees, and then you're you know, sort of dithering the others out there and falling them off. You also you have the amacrine cells and all of these new cells that you discovered recently that do motion detection. Um, are they included? Do they follow the same pathway? The, the, the amacrine cells do not leave the, um, the retina. So all the other neurons that are there on the retina, the amacrine cells, horizontal cells, bipolar cells, that's all inside the retina. That's communication. The only ones... They communicate by LGN? The only neurons that get their signals out of the retina are the, are the retinal ganglion cells. And those are the ones that send their fibers to the LGN. All right, but the, so uh, I guess uh, what I'm trying to get to is the motion information. Oh, yes. How, is, uh, what is it? I, I see, I see, I see what you're saying. So, so, so there are, there's a class of direction selective um, retinal ganglion cells and amacrine cells uh, that, um, that, uh, that exist there, but it's a, it's a relatively, when you, in, 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 when you put the whole population together, it's a very small fraction of the population. So about 90, uh, I want to say maybe between 80 and 90 percent of these fibers leaving the, the retina are the so-called parvo cell parvocellular neurons or, or midget retinal ganglion cell class, which are, um, which are not responding so much to motion. There's kind of uh, maybe their cutoff frequency around 10 or 10 or 12 hertz. And then there's about another 10% or so with the, with the magnocellular class of neurons or the, the parasol retinal ganglion cells. They have a much higher bandwidth, but even those aren't direction selective per se. It's a very specialized class of retinal ganglion cells that are direction selective. And so they're there where they project, a lot of them project to the, uh, to the, to the uh, supericoliculus, which is involved in driving eye movements. So whether they project the LGN onto the cortex, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And then the supericoliculus connects to V1 as well? Uh, no, it does not. It, 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 the supericoliculus itself does not project to V1. V1 projects to supericoliculus. It's a one way there. So V1, V1, you can, one way to think about it is V1 is sort of doing some processing and then so telling, the telling the supericoliculus where to move the eyes. Yeah. yeah. But it's not, but supericoliculus does not, does not project to V1. It, 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 supericoliculus, pro, uh, supericoliculus projects to the pulvinar, which is the nucleus, of the th nucleus of the thalamus, which in turn projects to the cortex. So supericoliculus can get its signals to the cortex, but, it's, but, but they go through the thalamus. One last so, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you said there's um, 100,000 to uh, 196, basically, 14 by 14. 100,000 neurons total in a square millimeter. That's, that's now all the different layers. Right. right. But they, they, they're coding for different orientations and so on. So, so if you have 10 orientations, that's 2,000, 10 scales. 
20,000. Okay, so you're saying it adds up. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe it does. So, so, you know, so, so one could sort of put together some mark. In, in not, you know, I guess one thing we're, uh, you know, we're missing here is also time. Right? We have to think about not a diff all the different orientations we have to tile, but all the different directions of motion, uh, color, disparity. You know, maybe when you put all these different dimensions in, then you get up to 100. And that's why you need 100 to 1. I don't know. I mean, this, these are just verbal things we're putting out. Somebody needs to put this all together into a quantitative model and show you actually need this many dimensions. And that's just not been done. But um, so, so, so I think, you know, I think it's, it, right now it's just an interesting question. It's not, it, you know, this is sort of a, the, the, an aspect of the biology uh, that, that the models just have not made contact with yet. I'm not saying they can't, but, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so, that's, um, <clears throat> so, that's one, so that's one thing we see from the biology is that these representations are highly overcomplete. So it suggests that something else besides redundancy reduction must be, must be at work. And another thing we, we could argue is that what, what we really want is a meaningful representation. You know, we, we're not just, we don't just want to code information. I mean, that's important. Uh, we have to do it. But we want to sort of get beyond just coding. And we want to sort of, sort of derive some meaning, and sort of going back to this idea of recovering some information about the world from all this um, coded information. OK, so, so, uh, so we have to appeal to a different principle. And so one, an, another principle that's, um, that was advanced also by Horace Barlow, it turns out, uh, about 10 years later in the early 1970s, is this idea of sparse distributed representation. Okay, so the idea of sparse coding or sparse, sparse distributed representation here is that uh, in comparison to decorrelation or simply removing statistical dependencies or something like that, the idea here is very, stated very simply is, th is that we want to try to find a way to group things together. We have all this information to coming, to, coming in in forms of like little image patches. Think about little, little 14 by 14 image patches coming into a square millimeter of cortex, a little patch of cortex analyzing a little patch of image. Uh, so we want to have all this data coming in. And the hypothesis is that what the cortex is trying to, find, trying to do is it's trying to find a way to reformat the information or group things together in the input so that you can describe what's going on in terms of a small number of events at a given point in time. OK, so now another way of thinking about this in terms of redundancy reduction. OK, so what we talked about before, where you're trying to make maximal use of channel capacity, this is actually a very bad thing to do in terms of redundancy reduction, right? Because what you're doing in, in, this, in this kind of coding scheme, any given neuron's activity is highly predictable, right? It's spending most of its time at zero, right? So, and, and, you know, so in terms of channel capacity, you're not really making very, very effective use of it. But uh, another way of thinking about this is the way, the, the way that David Field describes it, is that you're taking this higher order redundancy, these higher order st statistical dependencies that exist in the form of the image pixels in the, in the, in the data domain, and you're transforming them into this new format where the higher order, higher order redundancy has been reduced, the higher order statistical, the statistical uh, dependencies have been reduced, but you, you have this, this low order redundancy, which is the fact that the neurons are sparse. They spend most of their time at zero. But that's something you're willing to put up with because, it, because you've achieved a more meaningful um, format or description of the information coming in. Another way of thinking about these um, sparse codes is uh, if, we, if, we, if we juxtapose them to, uh, to sort of other various coding schemes that you might imagine. So what we're showing here is just kind of a, a, like maybe a sort of continuum of different coding schemes. Dense codes over the, over the left, uh, which would be like an ASCII code, which is a very dense code. Or when you do something like principal components analysis, right? That's a very sort of dense coding scheme uh, where, or where you're trying to maximize channel capacity. And, uh, and sort of the, the, the other end of the extreme would be what we call in neuroscience grandmother cells and what you call in machine learning uh, nearest neighbors and what you call in uh, image processing uh, vector quantization. Okay, so that, the, that is the idea here that you're going to have one neuron for each and every pattern that you ever see come in, right? So it's a very, very sparse pattern, right? It has a sort of sparsity of one. And uh, so, so one way of looking at this, you know, the advantage of this kind of coding scheme here is that going, you're going to make the most use of all your neurons in terms of coding information, right? In terms of maximizing channel capacity or something like that. But it may have the difficult advantage that it, uh, disadvantage that is difficult to read out. So if you want to do pattern separation or pattern classification in this representation, it's very difficult because uh, your patterns are not linear, se linearly separable. They're sort of highly entangled in these manifolds that are sort of curled up against each other and so forth in this low dimensional space that's very dense. <clears throat> 
And the advantage of this kind of coding scheme, of course, is that now pattern classification is trivial, right? If you want to know if a certain pattern is there, you just say, well, look at that dimension. Is that axis active or not? Right? So you sort of almost trivialize the problem. But you, 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 you demand a lot of resources to do this well. Okay? So for, uh, I think David Field has calculated for like an 18 by 18, I'm sorry, an 8 by 8 pixel image patch. Just for an 8 by 8 pixel image patch, you would need on the order of 14,000 um, dictionary elements to, to do a decent job at, um, at you know, effectively coding the information in that image patch. So, so you're going to require a lot of, a lot of neurons. So you have a, or another way of you know, saying it, you have a low combinatorial coding capacity. If you have n neurons, then you can only code n things you know, that come in. So, so sparse codes sort of live at some, some point along this continuum. They're closer to, the, to, these, to these grandmother cell codes than they are to these dense codes. But the idea is to have multiple, you know, multiple neurons active. And so now we achieve some kind of combinatorial coding capacity. So I have a, a very large population of n neurons. I'm only going to allow k neurons to be active at any given point in time. So now I have n choose k possible things I could represent with this, with this kind of coding scheme, uh, which is still huge. Okay? But now I've, but the, hopefully what I've gained is the explicitness that, I, that, that we liked about this kind of representation. It was very explicit, very easy to do pattern classification, very easy to read out, that we still have that advantage of, of reading out and um, having something more interpretable that's higher for easier, easy, higher, um, easier for higher stages of processing to make sense of. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the conjecture, is that what V1 might be doing is something more like this. And so the first hint of this um, came from a work by uh, some modeling studies by David Field um, and in that same paper that I mentioned in 1987 where he pointed out the 1 over f power spectrum of, of not, 1 over f squared power spectrum of natural images. Uh, where he showed that the, uh, if you just take a look at the response of a Gabor filter, so if you take a model V1 receptive field and convolve it with a natural scene, what you find is that the histogram of the response of that, of that model neuron is highly peaked at zero and with heavy tails as compared to a Gaussian of the same variance. Okay? So that's very interesting from the, po from the, from the point of view of, um, of projection pursuit. So projection pursuit is a method in, in statistics for trying to find non-Gaussian structure uh, or trying to, find, um, trying to find structure and data. And the idea is to try to find low dimensional projections that are as non-Gaussian as possible. Because the idea is that these non-Gaussian projections are the ones that tell you, they're most diagnostic about, they tell you the most about, about the structure of the joint distribution of the data. Okay? So if you're just going to project along any random direction in this, in this space, the central limit theorem would tell you that you're just going to get a Gaussian distribution. Okay? So you'd have to be sort of very lucky to project us on, along some direction that gives you a non-Gaussian histogram. So this was the first kind of clue that there's some kind of relationship between the structure of these receptive fields in V1 and the statistics of natural scenes. Right? They seem to be ma matched somehow statistically in this way. You would have had to get very lucky to get this by accident. Okay? And then the second thing, that this, the second observation here is that what's interesting about this is the way in which it's non-Gaussian could have been non-Gaussian in many different ways. The, way. the particular way in which it's non-Gaussian is that it's highly peaked at zero, right? So that suggests that the filter is sitting there most of the time off, or close to being off. OK, so that suggests the connection to this idea of sparsity. So, uh, so together with David Field um, in, 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 in the mid-'90s, we explored this, uh, this model of what we call the sparse coding image model. And it was, a, it was a way to sort of get at this without making any prior assumptions about what these receptive fields should be. Let's just say you have a, you have to, let's say you have a population of neurons, and there's some, initially some random weights coming to those neurons. And we're saying, OK, you figure it out. Please try to arrange your weights of these neurons to try to make the sparsest code as possible, given the statistics of the ensemble that's coming in. So I'm going to let you view millions of you know, little sort of natural image patches that might come in on any given day and try to, try to organize this, this code in such a way that, it, that, that makes the representation as sparse as possible. So the way we formulated that is as, as a generative model, shown here, where, where we're thinking about, again, a, a sort of little patch of cortex describing a little patch of image. So an example I'm about to show you, these, these patches are about 16 by 16 pixels. So we're going to take a 16 by 16 pixel image patch and describe it in terms of a population of neurons. So each neuron we can think of as having a basis function or, um, or sort of a feature descriptor or a dictionary element. We'll call that phi sub i. And the amount by which that feature is present is the activity of the neuron a sub i. So this, this coefficient of that basis function we're taking to be literally the activity of a, of a, of a neuron um, in, in, in V1 in this population. 
OK, and so, so the idea then is, there is to say uh, well, we can start out these, these features as being random functions. They're just you know, little 16 by 16 patches. And we're going to start them out at random and try to adapt them to, to, to match the structure of the images coming in. OK, so, th so this can be done by uh, basically just writing down a cost function, which is the difference between these two terms, the difference between the image and this model of the image squared, trying to minimize that squared error, but also pe putting a penalty on these coefficients to try to keep them um, at zero as much as possible. OK, so the result of this optimization procedure is, uh, is, is, a, is a dictionary of learned functions so here, shown here on the left. So each of these patches corresponds to a learned dictionary element phi sub i. So each of these functions start out as a completely random function. And they converge on this solution where they're um, oriented. They're localized within the image patch. So that's a very sort of important feature because all the methods up to then that tried to explain uh, these V1 receptive fields in terms of things like principal components analysis uh, yield highly non-localized solutions, the, or else they have to localize them artificially. So here, without any other constraints, these functions are choosing to be localized. And they're also band pass. They come selective in different scales. Okay, so they're, they're choosing different scales to analyze the image at. So all these functions are basically emerging from the statistics of natural scenes together with this criterion of sparsity put, up, put upon the neural population. Over here, we're just plotting these, func these learned functions in the parameter space. Each, each dot corresponds to a function over here plotted in the joint space of the um, spatial frequency bandwidth and the orientation bandwidth of the neuron, just meant to indicate that basically it's very close to where most V1 neurons, the oriented V1 neurons, would, would hover in the same parameter regime that you see coming out of the algorithm. OK. So, um, so, so one other sort of thing we can look at now is the, is the degree of overcompleteness. So that population I just showed you here it was not particularly overcomplete. There's about is basically a critically sampled population. There are just enough units in the population as there are image pixels at dimensions in the input coming in. Okay, so it's not very overcomplete at all, and we get this kind of Gabor-like representation. What Fritz Sommer uh, showed together with a student in his lab, Martin Wren, is that by um, increasing the overcompleteness of, our, of the representation and at the same time imposing something they called hard sparsity. So in our algorithm, we just basically put something like an L1 cost function or um, other kinds of cost function, which, which don't necessarily enforce that the coefficients be exactly 0. That just being small is also rewarded. So in Fritz's scheme, they actually demanded hard sparsity, that you have exact zeros in the representation. And it turns out, for, for some interesting reason, that does tend to make a difference in, in the dictionaries that are learned. And, uh, but, but actually, the major thing that's giving this effect here is the overcompleteness. So what they showed is when you increase the overcompleteness here to about three times, that the set of functions you get out um, have more diversity in them. So you, now you find some functions that are not oriented at all. They're sort of like spot-like, um, circularly symmetric bases. Others that are oriented, sort of more Gabor-like. And then others that are sort of more sort of ring and undulate. And interestingly, if you compare that to uh, populations of receptive fields you can see in V1, there's a much better match. And this is actually data from Dario Ringosh, Ringosh's lab here at UCLA. OK, so he did a very nice job just parameterizing the families of receptive fields that he sees. And if you compare his measured receptive fields to what you see out of their algorithm, um, it's a much closer match. And uh, so uh, the. Uh, so we, with, together with David Warland, we, we expanded the dimension uh, over completeness up to about 10 times. And so this is the full set of ten, uh, um, uh, 10 times over complete bases learned on a 16 by 16 image patch. And what we, what we showed here is that um, as you increase either the sparsity or the degree of over completeness, you get a higher div diversity in the, um, in the sort of families of receptive fields that emerge. So in the lower left-hand corner, you sort of, sort of these mo see this monolithic distribution the center about where I showed you like what you get for when you have just enough basis functions. And as you increase either the overcompleteness or the, um, or the sparsity, then you see that sort of monolithic distribution kind of split into at least three different families of functions. And I'll just briefly uh, sort of show, show those here. So out of this whole population, we can sort of zero in on, um, sort of zoom up on them. And we can see that some of them are uh, one family of functions that emerge are these blob functions that are non-oriented. These oriented functions, and now which, which are sort of more ridge-like, they extend through, uh, throughout the entire image patch. So they're highly elongated. And another, form, another class of functions which are sort of grading-like. And what we were able to show is that these, uh, those, those are the three kind of modes of that distribution. This is just the learning of them, um, showing that the solutions are very stable. So it's not just the result of, uh, of uh, you know, overfitting or local minimum in the, in, the, in the learning or something like that is really, is really something saying something about the structure of the data. 
um, is that these, these circularly symmetric functions form a complete tiling uh, of, the, of the image domain, of the spatial domain, and these ridge functions seem to tile as well. So you get a whole collection of you know, ridge functions at different positions and different orientations, a full tiling of all those different um, sort of um, ori oriented functions. But what's interesting about the solution, I think, is that, uh, just going back to what we saw here, um, is that the, uh, you might ask, well, where did the Gabor functions go, right? And our nice little Gabor functions, which we so love, are gone, it turns out. So when you expand the degree of overcompleteness in the representation, um, it seems that these Gabor functions aren't really needed anymore. So one sort of a conclusion we're sort of toying with, I haven't entirely concluded this yet, but it seems like one, one way of thinking about these Gabor functions is that, the, is that they're actually sort of a compromise. That what the, what the system really wants, if you give it a full dictionary, the full degree of overcompleteness, it would rather have different families of functions, little, little sort of spotlight blob functions and highly elongated ridge functions and maybe sort of texture-like grading functions. And when you force it to a much smaller dictionary, that it's actually struggling with that. And the Gabors sort of emerge as a kind of you know, compromise um, in, in, in that solution space. And so it, it's at least one suggestion here. But I should note that we're here at even 10 times over complete. We're still an order of magnitude remo removed from the degree of overcompleteness one sees um, in, in the visual cortex. All right, so I'm already over time. So I'm going to have to end here, and I'll can just pick up with uh, t tomorrow um, where I left off today. But I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Thanks. <laughs>